welcome you all on behalf of the Twum Foundation. Dr. G.B. Deglurkar, sir, thank you so much for coming. It means a lot to all of us here, including everyone at Bori, and all of us here that you are here and sparing some time for us. Um, Aarti and Atul Kirloskar. Atul, thank you. <laughs> Aarti, thank you for coming. Lekha Poddar, I'm hoping Sarah will join us soon too, but the reason, you know, we are connected and I'm so glad for that. Zai, thank you for coming. Sean, thank you for taking the trip just to be here. Ali, thank you. Thank you, Navita. Thank you, Alok. And of course, I must introduce Alok and Chetan as trustees at Twam Foundation um, with me, hosts with me today. And a special welcome to, I mean, I can't welcome Bhupalji to his own place, but, <laughs> but thank you, sir, for your vision, your support, and for being there for us for the last one month. It means a lot, your encouragement to us. A uh, big welcome to the esteemed speakers today, Naman, Naman Ahuja, Mayank Kaul, Dr. Monisha Hamad. Thank you for taking the trip to Pune and making it come together. Uh, you know, thankful to Mark. I'm not here to give a vote of thanks, really. But I'm here to welcome you all and to say that I'm grateful that the energies have aligned and such wonderful people have come together today in this room. And I must share quickly with you that, you know, my some of you may know, some of you may not know that uh, I own a multi-designer store called Rudraksh. And 15 years being with Rudraksh, I did see a few gaps on the field. And uh, it kept nagging me. And actually, that's where Thwam Foundation was born from, to share with you. And um, we have been blessed with a lot of wonderful people who believed in us early in our journey and have been part of Thwam's initiatives. And this, as such, is uh, after COVID, uh, since 2020, nothing has happened. This is the first such public event that we are hosting and are so glad to have all of you. A lot of field trips. My husband keeps saying I travel a lot. Um, we are in the pursuit and search of something that we can't wait to bring to you next year. And Mayank is here. He leads the project to quite an extent ably. And uh, a very knowledgeable panel of speakers today uh, that we have who will share away more. With Mark, the association has been wonderful and because, as you see, one of the mandates has been to bring uh, research-driven, research-based knowledge to the public forums. So it has been also a privilege to associate with Mark, as they have some stellar publication um, material, not just magazines, also books and archives, uh, which have themselves become research and reference archives for so many studies across the board, uh, anthropological, sociological, of course, architecture, textiles, which is the main uh, topic for today. And it gives us pleasure to bring to Pune the initiatives of Mark Foundation, uh, which, of course, the speakers will talk more about today. And I'm glad to open this session. I, I mean, welcome to all my friends who are here. And if I may invite Bhupalji to share also about Bori and its initiatives, it would be wonderful to hear from you, sir. Would, would you like the films first and then? OK, welcome and thank you. Welcome all on behalf of uh, Bandarkar Oriental Research Institute. Many of uh, living in Pune also doesn't know what institute is doing. But institute is working for last 105 years on Indian culture. In fact, why uh, today Plum and Bandarkar is together 
because textile is also a part of a culture and a very major part of a culture. In fact, in Corona uh, was something bad for society, but uh, fortunately good for us because we started our online courses. And our first course, which was Introduction to Heritage of India, has got a tremendous response. And in that, uh, sir is here. He, he only started that the first lecture is, uh, is from uh, Dr. David Mulgar. But it has got three lectures on textile. If possible, you can go and see. As uh, Rasika is saying, I am not going to speak much, but show much about the institute. There is one film which is up to nine, uh, 2017, what has happened. And the history of our institute, which is very important. And why it is important? Because up to 1917, for our culture, the institutes were formed by the Britishers or Westerners, like Deccan College or Royal Asiatic Society. But Bhandarkar Institute is the first institute which has been which has been uh, Dr. Bhandarkar and his uh, all his uh, uh, those who were uh, working with him has started this institute. So this is the first institute started by Indian for Indian culture. That's the major part of it. This has what has happened up to 2017. After that, uh, in fact, this was a printing press and the printing machine is also with us and we would like to uh, uh, make it and show how printing was done at that time. And then we converted it into this auditorium. Uh, Abhayji Firodia, our chairman, helped us to make this auditorium. At the same, with his idea, we have built one big amphitheater where at one time 1,000 uh, people can see. And the last point, for 100 years our institute is working on research, but that research hasn't reached to the society at large. So we started to conduct online courses and we got a very good response for that online courses. In fact, uh, one 18 Parvans of Mahabharat uh, was mentioned in by our uh, Honorable Prime Minister in his Man Ki Baat also. That was the effect. And then we realized that this new medium or this new media will be very helpful. And our younger team, Mr. Chinmay Bandari, Gauri Moghe, they gave us an idea that we will have a platform where we can keep our courses and we started to work on that basis and uh, in September we floated our uh, own platform named Bharata Vidya. Right now there are six or seven courses so uh, material of uh, say 60 hours or something like it but we are aiming to have round about 1000 hour content to create a content as uh, Rasika ji has always told and to create a content is a big job because you have to not only create a content but curate it also, edit it also and then publish it also. So there are six courses on the uh, platform right now. You can, anyone can go and say Bharat Vidya and you, uh, you can uh, uh, see what courses are from Sanskrit to Bhas uh, and Kalidasa. Yeah, now about saying about there are three main persons over here, so I would like to mention only one thing about uh, textile. Mm, that is for thousands of years, that's a, a great thing about our culture. So I was just studying and uh, studying about Mahabharat and uh, I found out that as far as textile and dresses are concerned, our culture is so strong because in each and every culture, when 
a human being started wearing clothes it was one but after i think sir is here in first century bc uh, teaching started and people uh, started wearing the clothes which were stitched but we still use a single cloth like sari dhotar lungi so such a strong culture our culture is such a strong that majority of people are still using that uh, thing that one cloth wrapped around a body that's a great thing i think all these uh, eminent person will explain the reason for it because westerners are using now still whatever has been stitched but our culture is still using these uh, dresses that's what I, i think is a great thing about our culture thank you thank you very much well good evening everyone and welcome i'm namana huja i'm the editor of marg publications in Bum- in mumbai and i'm also the dean of the school of arts and aesthetics at jnu in delhi um my areas of interest really are to do with intercultural exchanges and with the subject of art history i specialize in the coming of iconography and when did images start being worshiped at the first instance and why what led to the fundamental shifts in indian culture that transformed the society into an image worshiping society along the way came the fundamental question about how do we approach these issues and um over the years as a student and then as a professor once had the privilege to be able to work in a number of institutions early in my days as a student i came here to the bhandarkar oriental research institute it must have been in the mid 1990s and i plonked myself here in the library and i sat and studied and i'm sure the register where students are meant to sign their entries and exits will have my name and signature in it somewhere or the other and it was wonderful to be able to look through the material because um this was a question that had actually first been raised by bhandarkar himself and some one of his most famous books or monographs was on this very subject on the rise of shaivism and vaishnavism and explaining that what were the shifts that were happening and the privilege of being here was that this matter was being looked at comprehensively and not just looking at dating as it was coming out of ancient sanskrit texts but also looking at a lot of logic and archaeology and common sense which are becoming rarer <laughs> as we go along so it was quite nice to be able to be here amongst various scholars and to be able to start my research here and then over the years once i became editor of marg it became quite interesting to be able to see the extraordinary archives that marg had marg was created in 1946 by a group of avant-garde architects um art historians um mulkraj anand the literateur they all came together to be able to define a culture for the new india knowing that independence was round the corner something had to be done to be able to think about india as a modern nation an india that was going to accept and embrace modernity yet not lose touch with its past and that required extensive documentation of the past because the requirement to be able to package and understand and research the past to make it accessible is something that we continue to face as a major challenge so marx started off as a quarterly and we remain a quarterly journal and we produce four issues a year but other than that we also produce monographs and books on a variety of issues and since marg and the nation were both turning and turned 75 um it was time to do a little bit of introspection 75 is a venerable age to be able to start looking within and wonder what you have really achieved in your lifetime and what contributions you might have made and perhaps what you could have done better 
also. And so at that moment, it was a great moment to take stock of what the organization had achieved. And we produced and are producing five readers, five books which are called Readings from the Archives of Marg, the first of which was Readings on the Temple. The next one was Readings on Textiles, which is what we're going to focus on today. And the third one is going to be Readings on the Modern, on the idea of the coming of the modern. What does modernism in the Indian context really mean? The fourth one is readings on dance, on classical Indian dance or regional Indian traditions or modern dance or contemporary dance. How much of it is a product of revivalism? How much of it is a continuity of tradition? Can tradition continue if the spaces and the patronage are no longer the same? So can it even be the same? And yet it conjures up an image of our past and our history. And then one has to also think about that, are we doing this only for the sake of nostalgia? Or do we, does the past actually have re relevance for us? And the last one in the series, as hard as the one on temples, because of the exhaustive nature of our archive, is going to be the one on Indian painting, pre-modern painting, that goes from Ajanta all the way through our many different traditions of miniature, so-called miniature painting and wall painting that we have in the traditions of the Mughals, the Dakhni, Sultans, Pahari areas, and Rajasthan. So that will be the last of our readers. Each of these readers is designed in a manner to be able to allow modern pedagogues, modern teachers, to know if they wanted to develop curricula, how they could approach the subject in today's environment. To not just say that that, wa that is the right way because it was done by such and such scholar in the 1930s or 40s, but to say this was the concern of the nation, contextualize that piece of writing, and then look at it, that what are the current concerns and why are we revisiting that subject? And what new avenues are opening? What are the new questions for our times that are opening up? So, for instance, in the volume on temples, um, <clears throat> that incidentally was the very first marg that was produced. And I've put down a quotation there from Mulkraj Anand on inheriting the past. He said, as the discovery of India proceeds, we make efforts to inherit our past culture. We begin to realize that the gaps in our knowledge of the various historical periods are almost as vast as the centuries through which our ancient culture was built up. And of course, that is the mandate with which Marg started, to plug that gap. <clears throat> so as we started working on the volume on Indian temples, the first thing that we realized was that temples were not just made and used by Hindus. But that was a bit of a surprising statement to begin with. And to be able to see the vast numbers of Buddhist temples, or to be able to see the fantastic examples of Jain temples, the next issue that came up was, well, if you're working on temples, then are you going to write a book that is going to show that temples are not just limited to India? I have, these are screen grabs. These are from pages of the volume, which I think is some copies of which, I, the copies almost sold out. I think we've got the last few copies are available for sale um, outside, if anyone is interested. Um, and we might go in for a reprint <coughs> soon. So grab these if you can. Um, this issue of Marg moves beyond the all too well-known Khajuraho, Tanjavur, Konark, to look instead also at temples in other parts of South Asia <coughs> and what have been the decisive studies that have happened there. And they're fantastic little histories. The Nyatapol Temple of Bhaktapur, it's all about competition in urban design. Can a temple be higher than the royal palace or not? What was the city skyline? Who is, the, there were urban design issues even 300 or 500 years ago about regulations for the city. And this is an article that deals with that. Uh, 
moving into lands outside India, are we going to look at it as chauvinists who are going to talk about beyond the, you know, the politics of conquest? That, oh yes, they were also inspired by Indian culture. They were also inspired by Indian culture. And Java has Indian culture, and Thailand has Indian culture, and Sri Lanka has Indian culture. Pat ourselves on the back all the time, and then turn around and say, oh no, no, we believe in decolonization. We can't have double standards. We can't turn around and say that the British colonized us, and that colonialism is bad, and then we ourselves are culpable of colonizing Southeast Asia and spreading our cultural ecumen in Southeast Asia. This was a problem for the early nationalists. And in the 1940s, they were very aware of this. And so the subject of Southeast Asian temple art and architecture was written about with far greater care. And the adjectives that were being used in the writing were used very carefully to be able to not let India be accused of being a colonial power, just as the British we were accusing the British of being a colonial power. So what was the difference? After all, we are all using English as a medium of communication. And these temple cultures were using Sanskrit or Tamil as their medium of communication. And if colonization is about the spread of culture and knowledge systems and language, then were we culpable of colonization too? These became very tricky questions at the rise of the Indian national movement, and they had to be dealt with. So when we talk about influence, whether in the field of Ikkat, or in the field of tie and dye, or whether we talk about it in the field of temple art and architecture, we need to be very careful in the language we're going to use, in how we're going to talk about these things. And so we bring that matter up. How are we going to give the countries in which this culture went their agency as innovators Today, all of us who use English as a language, we consider ourselves the greatest literateurs in the English language. We don't wish to be regarded, Indian literature in English is not regarded as some kind of substandard literature, it's regarded as the pioneering literature of English in the world. And so, is a Javanese presentation of the Ramayana to be looked at as derivative, or is it to be looked at as their cultural expression? So these became issues with which we began to think about these matters and introduce these chapters. As I was saying, we, the issue of Marg moves beyond the all too well-known Khajuraho, Tanjavur, and Konark to look instead at temples at Kutch, in Kutch, in Kashmir, in Bangladesh, in Nepal, in Sri Lanka, Kerala, Southeast Asia, each with a unique style. We examined in this volume, rock cut temples, um, extraordinary wood, bamboo, and brick temples. We looked at the whole question of circular temples, not just the square planned ones. And we looked at modern multi story and concrete and steel temples. Bewildering though they may be in their architectural range, this volume shifts our focus away from their variety to look instead at a core question which is on who built temples in the first place and why. What were temples used for? Given that many Hindus don't believe in image worship, then what makes a temple a valid space for worship and what legitimizes their public role? We examine the nature of these activities and the communities they fostered and how, in turn, temples began to move, become the focus of urban centers. Ethnographic, historical and comparative approaches are the fundamental ways in which we have gone about this volume. Temples, as this volume will show you, have adapted and changed over the centuries and served a variety of ritual functions. They have also been major centers of the arts, painting, sculpture, dance, and drama. To celebrate 75 years of Marg, this bumper issue brings together the writings of pioneering art historians who have deepened our appreciation of this hallmark of Indian architecture. Now, looking through the archive of Marg reveals shifts in the understanding of temples and how Indian art history has radically changed over the past 75 years. <clears throat> 
Many of our writers who were trained in what we now regard as old-fashioned colonial vocabulary, there was little hesitation amongst those writers to use terminology that we no longer find acceptable. So for instance, the Aryan versus Dravidian nomenclature, for instance, remains deeply embedded in the public imagination even today and is something that warrants clarification. The earliest writings on the history, culture and language of South Asia divided their subjects into Aryan and Dravidian. These two terms were associated with racially governed aesthetic and behavioral characteristics rather than being limited to, as we at Bori would say, to linguistic categories that we know them to be. Yes, right? As global speakers of English, as I was just saying, and even though all of us don't hail from the UK, we know that the language of one community can be naturalized to become the native tongue of someone from another part of the world to exp express their culture rather than be a communicator of Britishness. Right? Well, much the same way, in the case of Indo-Aryan and Dravidian, we already know that these communities were exchanging vocabularies in the second millennium BC. That's well over 2000 years prior to the construction of the earliest temples. How then can this nomenclature be appropriate for describing discrete racial groups within their own cultural or aesthetic categories 2000 years later? You know, why do we still use that terminology? All the more difficult it is to accept the writings of those with the colonial education with allusions to Aryan impulses or Aryan styles in art when referring to Indian temples and iconography. So even when trying to find a more progressive understanding of Indian culture, my predecessor, Mulkraj Anand, uh, Mulkraj Anand, was himself compelled to use this vocabulary. This was commonplace in all the old issues of Marg right until the end of the 1960s, when finally a more considered approach began to emerge in the writing. A single remark should suffice as an example. In December 1963, for instance, Mulk, Mulk wrote, the culmination of all the strains of civilization of more than a thousand years of the Aryan Dravidian fusion seems to be the basis of the Gupta classical renaissance. Right? Now, the problematic nature of this remark is not just limited to the use of Aryan and Dravidian, but the very binary understanding of Indian culture, as if it had only two constitutive elements. The history of its sheer variety or its plural origins thus gets oversimplified. The remark also reveals another bias which was held dear by art and cultural historians which described the Gupta period as the great classical idiom of Indian art, a period which was previously thought to have revealed the oldest Hindu temples. Scholarship discussed the subject of the origin of the temple with far greater nuance. We now discuss it with far greater nuance. To trace the origins of each of the separate elements of Hindu temples, we must look more closely at Buddhist structures, where we get evidence of many features that are found in Hindu construction, making it relevant to see two traditions in parallel. For instance, the stupa may be accompanied by a dhvaj or a pillar with an animal capital, just as many temples are. They may both be sited at locations where there is a water tank or a tirth, at locations where there was a legendary event, or on a hilltop. Similarly, one of the forms of early Buddhist shrines is a Chaitya cave, which often has an apsidal ground plan, that is, one which has a long corridor with a rounded or oval ending with a vaulted roof. This began to be used later as one of the standard types of temples as well. So the long history of the Gajaprishta, or apsidal temples, is traced to Buddhist Chaityas, or for the square cell, in what is now called what we call a kuta, is widely represented as a hermitage in ancient Buddhist sculptures, whether in Takshila or in North India. Finding Indian terminology was thus imperative for Indian art, for how could and even why should Indian art have to be explained in the Latinized vocabulary of Western art history. The rediscovery of Indian vocabulary was an integral part of the Indian national movement when generations of Indians had been alienated from their cultural foundations on account of colonialism.
scores of ancient texts were mined to find precise terms for iconography and architecture. And in the 1940s and 50s, the savants V.S. Agrawal and Moti Chandra began publishing lexicons of Indian art terms. The scope of understanding Indian art on its own terms was seen as not just being feasible but also necessary. And this became an active pursuit in the decades in the early decades of Indian independent independent India up until the 1960s. The project was revived under Madhusudan Dhaki and Michael Meister through the American Institute of Indian Studies, and comprehensive the comprehensive Encyclopedia of Indian Architecture was then produced with elaborate glossaries of what these terms may have been. Now, while recovering a vocabulary of one's own was much needed, the exercise sometimes became excessive and very intimidating for students. The study of the Shastras describing these terms was looked at, there was a reaction to that by some scholars who said that this was all irrelevant because according to some scholars, the terminology was arcane and at the best of times would only have been known to pundits who were far removed from the ground realities of the builders of the actual mysteries, the craftspeople and the common public. They believed that studying ancient texts was not essential for a scholarly knowledge, was only essential for a scholarly knowledge of temples, but we should instead be looking at common vocabulary, common parlance instead. So came another problem. Should we use vocabulary drawn from Sanskrit or should we use regional texts? Did medieval Gujarati pilgrims, for instance, who visited Kanchipuram, use Tamil descriptive terms at the temple or did they use Gujarati descriptive terms at the temple? Or were they using Sanskrit as the mediating language? Right? These become major questions for us today. Besides, only some of the most learned architects and artists may actually have read those Sanskrit texts, the majority of the artists and builders not having been familiar with that language. So at the same time, as many anthropologists and linguists have noted, Practitioners groomed in a gharana or a guild inherit their knowledge by living in a milieu where adherence to tradition becomes all but instinctive. These debates are important, but they can be carried too far. Um, I don't think these debates are purely academic. They should not be regarded as a diktat that the Shastra should not be looked at as a diktat that limited creativity or the development of new styles or new kinds of images. Indeed, well into the 19th century, many new kinds of temples were being invented and created in the sacred city of Banaras itself. And this is a good example of one where you could visit all the sacred shrines of Banaras by going to one temple. So rather like one of those pilgrimage textiles where you would have all the sacred shrines and all the sacred sites present on one textile, which you could have darshan of. You could have darshan of the whole of Banaras by going to this one temple. Debate on the primacy of texts versus an understanding of practice has only been one of the major dilemmas that undergird the scholarly questions of the past few decades. Several editors of Mar greatly expanded the understanding of our field to parameters anew. Some volumes by Vidya Dehejia deserve special mention. Royal Patrons and Great Temple Art, produced in 1988, was a landmark because it opened up a major aspect of understanding the reasons why royal people built temples and what public role they were trying to serve. Temples were often built at pilgrimage sites to celebrate a victory, but also in memory of someone. And so this memorialization is something that we've not actually paid enough attention to. That why people would create a public monument as a memorial shrine. And so the punya or the good wishes, the merit that would accrue from the pilgrims would go to the memory of the ancestors perhaps. The Hegia triangulated the institution of the temple with its patron, but also and crucially the artist and the craftspeople who conceptualized the entire edifice and provided the labor for the construction. So what do we know about the lives of the sculptors? And this is becoming a big subject in temple art and architecture now. 
because we've started seeing the Mason's marks and documenting them. And this was earlier done first by Professor Shattar when he was looking at the material for the Hoysala temples, and then it began to expand and was looked at by Ramanath Mishra when he was looking at the Central Indian temples. And we now have a huge database of the number of shrines, and this is expanding, where we have masons and guild marks on these sculptures. So they're not just anonymous works of sadhana, but then we start coming into issues of patronage, right, like we do with textiles, or we do with dance, or we do with any other art, where you can imagine that artists might have been competing with each other to get the best commissions, right? So was it just an act of making something out of a sense of religious piety and only sadhana that was involved in the making? I'm not decrying it. I'm not saying that there wasn't piety, but I also have to have our feet on the ground and be realistic. Because if this was such a significant part of the economy where they were making temples for thousands of years and in such large quantities of them, this must have been one of the most significant forms of employment in the country if you think about how many people must have been stonemasons and sculptors in this, in this region. Um, <clears throat> so some of these issues are raised in this particular essay, uh, in these essays, along with some very tricky things, some marvelous temples, like did Byzantine architecture influence the construction of the Bhitargaon temple, which has the first representation of the true arch. It's one of those mysterious things you know, for all of you who know architecture, the true arch actually comes up at Bhitargaon in South Asia first. And then it comes up again only a thousand, when many, 600 years later at Balban's tomb, where it comes in through the Islamic world. And so how, what was happening? The Romans had true arches and the Byzantine cultures had true arches. And so was it that the Romans and the Byzantine cultures were in touch with the Guptas and were there true arches earlier? And was it a tradition that was lost? Now, what, the one thing that this volume ends up proving is that temple architecture did not stay static, and it was a rapidly changing and advancing tradition, open to the traditions of the world, absorbing new ideas. We needn't lament, therefore, with the coming of steel into our modern temples. After all, temples have always been adaptive, and there isn't any one single type that that is the pure or the correct type of temple, because throughout history there have been innovations in temples. And that brings us to one of the last segments of the book, which, is quite, which was quite a revelation. One of the things that Marg has really worked on is how do we know what we know about temples? And how have these temples survived? Jirnodhar is something that we pay very little attention to in our scholarly circles. Renovation and maintenance, repair, conservation is something that we don't talk about. We always talk about the one who does the Udghatan, the one who comes in, puts the foundation stone for the building, but not the many people who have worked at maintaining that building over the years. How did something survive? Who was the continuing patron of that site over the next 500 years that kept those walls and bricks and painted it after every monsoon, put the dampness right after every monsoon, fixed that monument? Who were those people who kept that monument alive and did they not make an intervention in that building when they worked on it? Did they not alter it? Or does it just remain the Gupta period temple as we see it now? And there's a big flaw in the way we teach because we don't disaggregate portions of the temple and say actually the foundations may be of this century, but that repair work and that wall and that and that is of this period, that period and the other period. And so the, the temple as it now survives ought not to be simply linked with the year of its inception, but all the different years of its maintenance. Now this comes me, brings me back to the fundamental question of the idea that a temple can actually be anywhere you want it to be. And it doesn't really require all of these issues like a construction according to a Vastu plan. And when does Vastu history itself start getting revived? So we deal with some of the rituals that went with these and some of the most extraordinary temples which don't even have a murti in the Garbhagriha. And what do those temples actually communicate and what do they mean? While talking about craftsmanship, one has to nowadays be very attentive to matters of caste politics 
and those who get included and those who get excluded. And the temples have been a space for a lot of political action. The Vaikum temple entry movement finally allowed lower caste people to be able to enter temples, which they were not allowed earlier. Um, or what is the right of a craftsperson who actually is the bronze caster, who cannot continue to work with the temple icon after it has been consecrated and can't touch it any longer. Um, so what are their feelings and views about all of these matters? And that comes in. And then, of course, we have to deal with the colonial interregnum and what happens during that period through the ASI and the revivalism, through post Curzon and what happens with our shrines and, the, and these issues. So the, the temple's volume really brings up a number of these matters. In the volume, one of the key sites that I've tried to pay attention to in my selection was the site of Varanasi because it was the one of the most um, exciting sites to be able to study how trendy new styles of what we regard as Islamic art and architecture was so readily adopted and brought into the arches, the gumbads that are there all through Western India as well as into Central India. And the shift in the new kinds of temples, the courtyard temples that came up in, the Haveli temples that came up in Rajasthan and went up all the way into Lahore and in the Punjab as well. So it's interesting to be able to study some of those temples. We've looked at matters of pilgrimage. We've looked at a few temples in Pakistan, but not as many as we would have liked to have included. It was very tough to be able to uh, make decisions. Uh, what you see on the right at Orcha is the interior of a temple, not of a mosque, in, in, in case anyone is <laughs> mistaken about the matter. Um, <coughs> Temple spaces were not just architecturally important, but also bustling socio-economic centers. Often they were not limited to just one iconographic program relevant to one community, but were used simultaneously by several. They reinvented themselves to suit new exigencies, and this brings new religious imperatives to bear on a temple. They existed in a specific agricultural and hydrological environment, and today no studies can be complete without looking at the water management that temples were part of. The networks that these, that these sites established take us to trans-regional histories connected with pilgrims as well as those connected via trade to far-flung places that connected the Himalayas to Southeast Asia. And finally, we must situate them within the shifts in aesthetics, the intersections of material culture and performance culture, <clears throat> of being able to look at religion and art history, of ritual and its sensorium. Some stimulating essays here help interpret these subjects. And so we looked at the whole Gotipua tradition, the Devadasi tradition, and then the revivalism by Indian dancers of actually reconstructing Bharatanatyam and other dance traditions by looking at temples. And so dancers who would camp out at temple sites was very common in the 1950s, whether it was Damianti Joshi living in Kajurao for months on end, or it was Padma Subramaniam cataloging all the Ardavus and Karanas, um, uh, Chidambaram, to be able to reconstruct the entire sequence of Indian dance through what was seen on historic temples. So temples have proved to be a source for history writing for many other kinds of histories that were written. I must conclude by thanking our many patrons who may manage to keep Marg alive and who have allowed this volume to be produced. It's been a great privilege to be able to, as a scholar, to be able to have access to this archive and to be able to start presenting for you all of these five different readers. I've given you a little snapshot of what we tried to achieve in the Temples volume, but in the conversation that's going to follow, I'm hoping that Monisha Ahmed and Mayank Mansing Kohl will tell us more about the volume that they were a part of, which was the one on Indian textiles. Just a little word of introduction. Um, Mayank is a graduate of NID and has curated of many exhibitions of Indian textiles at the moment, which have really, for the past 10 years, he's been extremely prolific as a, as a curator. Um, he sits as an editor, uh, as a consulting editor for Architectural Digest, and I think he's played a very dynamic role in bringing contemporary textiles with great sensitivity and awareness of the situations of the market and the craftsman by being aware of both of these imperatives to 
be able to not just work as a revivalist, but to be able to work as a confident modernist. So thank you very much for being a part of our team, Mayank. And I would like to also please welcome Monisha Ahmed. Dr. Ahmed worked um, at Oxford on her DPhil, which was on the cultures of Ladakh, and um, has devoted much of her career to, um, again, a very conscionable way of looking at art and architecture, textile and material culture alongside the societies that produce them. And so the revivalism is not merely for the sake of the museumization of the material, but also for very integrally to feed back to the communities that she has worked with. Um, she runs LAMO, which is uh, an organization, and she was, for many years, she kept, she was a pillar at MARG as its associate editor. And um, I count on her good wishes and her help at MARG even now. Thank you both very much for being here. Thank you. Um, good evening and namaste. Thank you so much, Pune, for having us today. Um, thank you, Rasika, Alok, Chetan, and Arti from the Twam Foundation uh, for bringing us here. Um, Almitra from the Mark Foundation for thinking of this launch in Pune. Naman for so generously and kindly introducing us. Um, we're really, really honored to be here today. And um, both of us are going to be making this presentation, which looks at the role Marg has played in contributing to the generation and telling and reflection of Indian textile histories since its inception. Uh, so we have a sort of more or less structured presentation that we're going to share with you. But before that, I want to request all of you, I mean, this extraordinary presentation that Naman made on and showed us these extraordinary temples. For a second, I want you to just think of these textile, I mean, these temples with textiles. And that really, in some ways, points out the huge gap that textiles, which is what we're going to talk about today, this evening, uh, faces, that it is in many parts completely erased from the history of art and architecture. I mean, we go to temples today, we go to sacred sites, we go to occasions today. And temples like these would have carried rituals, performances, there would be carpets, there would be tents and canats, there would be canopies, there would be rituals where textiles would be changed, like in Vrindavan we see today. The idol would be, you know, the clothes of the idol would be changed several times a day. And that absence, which to I think people like us is so glaring when we look at marvels of architecture, is really something that I think has in many ways propelled us from uh, one moment to the other in our journey in textiles. Um, so do bear that in mind, that a lot of the textiles that we're going to be showing you on the covers of Marg actually occupied spaces and bodies that are often celebrated and discussed but the textiles not. Um, so with that, may I please request Monisha to um, begin the presentation. I think one of the things this um, issue of Marg has done, celebrating um, 75 years of textiles that um, it covers in, 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 its, in, the, in the magazine, similar to what Naman was just telling us about the temple issue that he brought out, it makes us um, stop and think. It makes us, um, as students of textiles, as people who have uh, gone on to do research and writings, um, it makes us sort of look at the trajectory of textiles that um, not only have been covered by Mark, but also that are prevalent in the country. Um, it makes us think of what is uh, still there, the continuities, uh, what has died out, um, what is, um, you know, being, uh, people are, have been um, revival efforts of the textiles. Unfortunately, we don't have um, Abigail McGowan with us, who is the editor of this volume, um, because it would have been very interesting, um, you know, in a similar way, like we had Naman to uh, talk about um, how he chose various articles um, of the issue, um, how he uh, um, sort of uh, the progression that, that uh, he, he took us through as he looked at the various um, um, temp arc articles of temples that have been covered in various um, issues of Mark. So what instead what my uncle and I have decided to do today is maybe look a little bit at textile studies in the country and uh, Mark's contribution to them, but also what was done um, before Mark um, came along. <clears throat> 
and um, in, in reflecting on this, we want to also sort of um, sort of attribute to Marg um, the sort of insight and critique that it has done for textile studies in the last seven decades, and um, the diverse number of people who have been who have worked um, in this field, from practitioners to academics to those who have worked with fashion, um, you know. And uh, though though uh, Marg initially started um, as a magazine looking at architecture and the arts. Um, in 1946. Uh, by 1949, the word architecture was dropped and it just uh, became a magazine that was all encompassing um, all our art forms. Um, it's interesting that we, we um, come from a country that such, has such a rich heritage of uh, textile um, making, textile use, but we don't have a single program of Indian textile histories in any formal educational institute in the country, nor anywhere else in the world. And uh, this helps us not only in emphasizing the role of Mark, but a broader need for independent organizations such as Buri or Twam um, themselves in filling such gaps. Um, but textiles have also uh, long been sort of this, you know, in when you study art, there's always this division between high art and low art. I mean, I know these divisions have blurred today, but, um, you know, maybe till about uh, you know twenty or thirty years ago, um, high art was considered sculpture and painting, and textiles were considered as as slightly inferior and low. They were associated with domesticity, with women. Um, though you know some of the finest textile makers have been males, and um, some of this was also sort of um, sort of. Um, associated in some of Marg's early writings, where it was seen that craftsmen, um, I mean, I just to quote, the handloom industry has the potential to convert the craftsmen into artists and designers. So it was not good enough for them to just be craftsmen. They had to be converted into, into being artisans. And it's very interesting because, you know, actually handmade textiles uh, manufacture in, in this country is the second largest employment generator. And though, um, it's largely an informal sector, so a lot of this goes account unaccounted for. There is the need to study it from many different perspectives, whether it's rural or urban. Um, and, and, um, and, and that's what we feel where Mark has made this important contribution. Um, so just to give you an um, idea, as Naman shared, Mark uh, was founded in 1946, and it was at the cusp of India's political independence from British colonial rule. And the early few decades of Indian textile studies were largely dominated by writings on collections of two main uh, museums. One was the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, which was the former Indian Museum, um, and the Calico Museum of Textiles, of which you see some images. You see um, some installation views of, of the galleries here. And this was um, set up, established in 1949. And till about the, the 70s, it was actually a, a very close relationship between John Irwin, who was a keeper of collections at, at the VNA of the Indian collections there, and uh, Gautam Ingira Sarabhai, who invited him uh, on several occasions to look at its collection. So it was a very close relationship between these two institutions that actually formed, in many ways, the basis of Indian historical um, studies of Indian historical textiles. And um, this was very conscious. This was, I mean, the Calico Museum today has, you know, almost has published about 40 to 50 publications. And it was a very conscious effort to look at what in many ways today we may look at a decolonial sort of perspective. How do we actually generate a perspective from here? Because some of the most extraordinary collections were traded outside of the country, and they have been studied from, in that sense, outside of the region. And, um, and prior to this, I mean, why this was important, and Mark, as we'll speak later, played a role in this generation along with Calico Museums and, and, and a few uh, small efforts, independent efforts elsewhere. Why this was important was because before this, as Manisha mentioned, textile wasn't really looked at a serious area of study. It, you know, there was a gender bias towards it. There was a certain kind of patronizing approach towards it. It was always looked at through the prism of function. 
and not high art, you know, not made for contemplation on its own, but as a means to either serve architecture or interiors or clothing. So um, the studies before this, uh, you know, um, which were sort of in the British colonial period, largely looked at the documentation of Indian textiles. So, you know, you had from the mid 19th century to the late 19th century, some of you may be familiar with what were called the great imperial exhibitions. And they showed textiles from India as a way for, you know, imperial powers to sort of, I mean, the imperial power, the British imperial power to, you know, claim superiority of, of having, having been able to sort of um, carry this great civilizational kind of um, art, you know, thrust into in a sort of imperial uh, idea. And um, so, you know, this is an image from one of the imperial exhibitions. Another form that this kind of documentation took was what are called paintings, company paintings, uh, which documented the, the people of India, because this was pre-photography, and how, were, how was Britain as a colonial power to, to sort of help understand its own people back home? you know, what people in India dress like, what were their professions. So just to give an idea of why it was so important for institutions like MAG and Calico to come up, this is an, um, an example of the kind of, um, you know, documentation was, that was done on how, what people wore. That is from a, that is a swatch from a very, very famous volume called the uh, Watson Volumes. And this was commissioned by the British office, by the British uh, India office, um, to collect samples. There are about 18 volumes to collect samples of what people were wearing, being produced in Indian handlooms, which could then become a reference to be copied by the mills of Manchester. So Indian textiles were sort of being documented for replication in the mills of Manchester as a way to understand Indian people through the colonial lens. Um, I think you may want to talk a little about the studies of natural dyes and botanical uh, studies that became yeah, important. Yeah, so Thomas Wardle in the 19th century um, uh, did a series of um, volumes where he did uh, natural dye samples in the same way that uh, Forbes was, Watson was actually documenting the textiles produced all over the country and, and making um, little sort of swatch samples and putting them in his volume. Uh, Thomas Waddle did the same things with natural dyes. Um, he produced over 4,000 samples of dyed cloth and thread of different natural fibers. And uh, whilst on one hand, um, you know, Watson and Wardle were doing this in order for replication or to better understand what was made in, in India so that it could be reproduced in, 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 in Britain and then brought back to India for sale. Um, on the other hand, today, a lot of their documentation provides us very important documentation. I mean, you know, sorry to use the word documentation again, but it provides us very important evidence or documentation of of what was made in, in India, uh, you know, um, if, if we are going back to, to research, especially with natural dyes, because we've lost a lot of that knowledge. Um, natural dyes were something that were not really, um, sort of the recipes uh, to make natural dyes were not really put down by people. Um, they were often kept as secrets. Um, and master dyers did not want to share their, their sort of recipes with everybody. So we, we lost a lot of these recipes, as Naman was telling us yesterday about the yellow, you know, the, the Indian yellow, and um, that where the cows were fed um, mango and then their, their urine was used, but we don't know uh, what the urine was mixed with. And so we have forgotten that, that, uh, that knowledge. Um, we also have uh, Roxburgh, who uh, produced a series of, of paintings where he, he did paintings of natural dye plants using the dyes from those plants. And he used uh, miniature artists to make those paintings. Um, a lot, they're mostly in the botanical gardens in Calcutta today. At the Bahadaji Lad Museum, um, we also have a collection of clay models. I mean, these were quite common in, 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 in uh, they were made, I think, in, in mainly in Lucknow or Allahabad or Bombay. some Bombay also. Um, but clay models to show us uh, what people wore, um, you know, how they, their, their headgear, their foot, their uh, footgear, I mean, their footwear, um, uh, they were made to show their, their working, um, also the tools. I mean, how did they uh, make zari? How did they spin, spin cotton? 
um, how did they, um, you know, make, um, you know, what were the raw products, um, you know, and it showed us both the decorative as well as the industrial arts that were produced in India at this time. So together, I think all of this is a very important knowledge base of what happened um, in the country, you know, prior to 1947, though it was not always done mainly as documentation. Um, we began then to look at um, issues of mark that were produced from the first issues um, that were uh, that focused on the handloom, that focused on khadi, that focused on very specific um, sort of well-known, popular um, uh, textile types, whether it was uh, patola or bhani or kantha, shawls. Um, they looked at groups of textiles, I think, more. Yeah, I'd like to comment a bit, draw your attention to the first cover. I mean, today when you would typically do a book on Indian textiles, you would normally see a flower hmm. or, a, or, a, or, a, or a, you know, animal or very what you would, you know, a conventional, traditional kind of design. And it's very interesting that, you know, Marg was sort of making this comment unconsciously or consciously about uh, paying a tribute to handlooms by using what we may see from today's perspective as a very modernist, um, progressive, uh, you know, kind of visual imagery on its cover. So I think that's that shares something with us about how progressive, um, uh, progressively handlooms and handmade textile traditions in India were looked at at that point through Marg. Um, I mean, Marg also went on to sort of um, uncover little known aspects of textiles, for instance, Kalamkari, uh, when um, I think Nelly Setna did her volume, uh, very little was known about Kalamkari. And uh, Nelly, you know, went, um, you know, to the, went back even to the BNA, to the British Museum, um, to look at early samples of Kalamkari. I mean, that's what first, you know, we, we know that's what first um, raised her interest in the subject. Um, then um, the Calico Museum volume. So yes, I mean, many of the issues of Marg over the years um, in its early decades focused on the collections of the Calico Museum. Like I shared earlier, there was a close relationship building between a small network of institutions and writers that were laying the foundation of Indian uh, textile studies in that period. But she mentioned Kalamkari, and I just want to share something quite interesting. Um, we've over the years looked at references to the word Kalamkari, which all of you I'm sure are familiar with today. It's the art of hand painting with natural dyes on cloth. And it's, it's, it's a very robust industry today where it exists in Andhra Pradesh, in Gujarat, many parts of the country. And the only reference we've actually found is to the word Kalamkar. So the person who painted around the 12th or 13th century, never the word Kalamkari. So when Nelly Setna, who was a art textile artist, she set up the, the, the workshops, the handloom workshops at the National Institute of Design in the 60s. She went on to become a textile pedagog and educa uh, educator at Sophia Polytechnic in Bombay, while having an independent practice as a, as a, as a textile researcher and artist. It was she who actually termed the word Kalamkari. And it's interesting because what is evident from the cover, it was not just referred to as hand painted to, you know, hand painted textiles. It was a coming together of block printed, stencil printed, and hand painted textiles. So what is interesting that, you know, and then from that point onwards, when Nelly publishes her first book, Nelly Setna, um, we see Mark take up that, that vocabulary. So what Naman was saying that, you know, questions of vocabulary become very, very interesting and important in what we are sharing in the evolution. And we see that reflected in Marx. So today we attribute almost 2000 years of an history to hand painting through a word which actually was used as recently relatively only in the 1960s and become so commonplace today. Um, around the 21st century, I mean, sort of the beginning of the, the 21st century, we began to see that Marx's focus on textiles um, changed slightly. Um, they began to look at more, um, I mean, we were still looking at, at textiles, but we were also beginning to look at ethnography. We were look, beginning to look at oral history. We were beginning to look at um, also trade of textiles or, or textiles. We also began to look at raw materials. I mean, earlier uh, volumes of Marg would look at, uh, let's say, you know, 
the silks and they would just describe the, the textiles or the finished pieces. They would look at the materials and the designs. But uh, very few of them would actually go back to tell the stories of the, pra the people who made the textiles or the symbolism in the textiles or look at how people lived with their textiles or even where the fiber came from. Um, I remember when Janet was doing her, her Pashmina book, Janet Rizvi, I mean, one of the things she insisted on is that, you know, okay, we have to go back and we have to look at um, the, the herdsmen who raised the Pashmina goat and we have to look at how, um, you know, Pashmina is actually, um, how goats are looked after so that we actually get this fiber that we call Pashmina. And I think that was important because uh, most uh, people and writers on textiles have just looked at textiles and they they look at the making of the textiles but they don't extend themselves beyond that to look at, you know, how is the fiber grown, or where does it come from, or how is it traded? And, and uh, that was one of the things that Mark started doing. Another thing we also went um, forward, and we, we sort of went forward, we all started looking at fashion. We started looking at, you know, for instance, in this Pashmina volume, what is the relevance of Pashmina today? How is it worn? It's gone beyond just the making of shawls. Um, how is it shaped? Um, you know, whether the, the whole industry today, whether it's these thin, wispy, uh, things that started coming out of uh, Nepal in, in sort of the 90s um, to, you know, we have an old whole industry today um, making embroidered and kani shawls. And it's very interesting because when John Irvin wrote uh, about uh, Pashmina shawls, um, I think it was in which issue? I can't rem remember, but maybe in, in the 60s or earlier. Um, he actually saw this whole kani weaving. Um, he ends by saying the kani weaving industry is dead. Um, and, um, you know, come back uh, 40 years later and it's a whole industry that has been revived today and is in many ways um, thriving. So through the study of Mark, we can also see a lot of the, the continuities that have come into this. Um, another thing we also found um, is that, um, like I said earlier, we began to look more at symbolism. Uh, Judy Freighter writes about textiles from Kutch where she talks about the stories of, of the, the communities and how they live uh, with their textiles. Um, I did the same for Ladakh. Um, we've done the same for, um, for other areas where we began to look at, um, I mean, sacred textiles drawing back to temples, also how textiles were used um, in, in places of worship around the country, um, you know, what they meant for the people who used them. Do you want to go on? And then um, we did a whole issue on, on natural dyes, where we looked at um, the history of natural dyes in the country. We looked at uh, uh, um, practitioners who work with natural dyes. We looked at artists such as Ajit Das um, and the way he uses natural dyes in his work. So I think we began to also just pick up not just um, specific textile types, but also uh, practices that were associated with um, with textile making, like natural dyes. And then um, Mayang's issue on cloth in India looked at more recent histories of textiles. Do you want to speak about that? Um, do you want me to change it? Sure, yeah, I think we can. Oh, OK, fine. You come yeah. to this. Um, sure. Um, this was uh, commissioned in 2015 uh, by then editors, co-editors, Jyot Dr. Jyotindra Jain and Naman, and Manisha was the associate editor. And the discussion was, or the idea behind the issue was that Mark, ha Mark tends to be seen often, or at that point was seen as a sort of more classical, classically oriented, you know, journal, uh, concerned more with subjects of the past. And that that wasn't true, it had carried uh, by then, you know, this sort of almost 70 year period, uh, questions and concerns and subjects of great contemporary um, relevance. So how do we carry all of this that Manish, Manisha shared with you, you know, all these, all these writings on textiles, and in that sense, link it to the today. I mean, we look at this gathering today, almost 60% of this gathering today is wearing handmade textiles, from block printed, to hand embroidered Parsi Gara, to Ikat, to Eri, to Chicken Kari. So what is this link between, you know, what Marg has written about in these decades up till sort of the early, the, the early 2010s and this phenomena? You know, why are, why are all of us wearing handmade? And what has contributed 
to to this phenomena which is unprecedented in the world uh, you know so that was really the sort of brief mm -hmm. how do we fill this gap of our understanding and um naman mentioned the question of caste and that is something that was important so both in my own introductory essay as well as uh, an article that I co-authored with um, anthropologist Meher, Ma Meher Varma, we, we looked at the question of how caste informs taste and taste making in the urban milieu. Um, you know, the questions of fashion and what is considered good fashion, classical fashion, um, and so on and so forth through the prism of uh, prism of uh, caste. That is certainly something that I'm very interested in and informs a very salient aspect of my work, uh, not always very pronounced. Um, we looked at commissioning articles that provided an overview um, of some of the more important carriers of textiles in India, like fashion, um, uh, natural dyeing, and so on and so forth. But also started, you know, attempted to look at the question of the people behind them, which mm -hmm. was not something that was incredibly important at that point. So we had two essays, mm -hmm. um, which I think were quite uh, quite relevant to a, and will be relevant to a longer discussion on Indian textile histories. One was on Suraya Hassan Bose, who was a designer and revivalist who looked at reviving textiles of the Deccan. She was based in Hyderabad. She was one of the early contemporary Dari designers who contributed to the shaping of brands like Fabinda in the 60s onwards, was exporting, was an entrepreneur. So we always think about women in Indian textile and craft as activists, as revivalists. But she was a hardcore entrepreneur who produced a certain kind of volume and the company and, and decided to go private. Um, so we looked at one dedicated um, article on her. Another was on um, a gentleman designer and artist called Jadunath Supakar, who was born in Orissa, who trained in visual arts in Shanti Niketan, and went on to work at a government series of networks, institutions called the Weaver Service Centers, ultimately retiring in Varanasi, who played a very important role in a series of um, design efforts uh, from the early 1980s to early 90s called Vishwakarma. And with that, question, again, returning to the question of vocabulary, because how do you look at someone like Jadunath Supakar? Conventionally, like Naman mentioned, we always used to looking at, you know, the Aryans and the Dravidians. In textiles, we're always looking at the craftsperson, the karigar, and the designer, hmm. you know? Yeah. So where does someone like Jadunath Supakar come in? And, you know, in Varanasi, for instance, you have the word that's often used is um, what's it's it's um, the grihast. Now, the grihast in many ways is an entrepreneur. In most cases, he's from the Marwadi or Gujarati community in Varanasi that actually uh, marketed Banaras for 2000. Three, uh, for 200, 300 years to make Banarsi the fashionable statement that we see today. And he's sort of someone who um, travels, sells the product, brings back ideas, understands market, but also provides the raw materials to the weaver. Um, and it's, you know, these many of these handloom centers are completely decentralized. So these kinds of questions of, you know, how do you, you know, how do you emerge and describe uh, you know, uh, you know, practitioners in the field outside of the typical binaries of, of maker and designer. You know, so some of these sort of articles were interesting. We also did a very interesting con series of conversations. Yeah. I mean, we also began to look in this issue as at uh, Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay and Popul Jayakar, both who have contributed immensely to. Um, the sort of revival of textiles in the country, uh, the continuation of textiles. They went around um, sort of, uh, I don't know, almost like looking for uh, textiles that had died out. Look, you know, I remember they, they went to places where, you know, people had uh, abandoned their looms and kind of got them to sort of start work again and, and make things again. And then we looked at their contemporaries. We looked at people who were still living today but who have contributed uh, to the textiles uh, of the country. But we looked at them, I think you could say a little bit generationally. We started with Jasleen Dameja, again, a very renowned um, textile scholar, but somebody who also worked very closely with Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay um, and went around the country traveling with her, um, studying textiles and 
um, seeing where textiles could be made again and uh, then sort of giving livelihood to people and sort of building up the industry to what it is today. We then looked at um, Jyotindra Jain. Do you want to? That As see. an institution builder, someone yeah. who had been involved with very early ethnographic studies in Gujarat, who set up the Shreyas Museum, the Vishala Museum. We looked at Ritu Kumar, mm -hmm. perhaps yeah. India's first fashion designer. And um, so we were sort of these conversations that Manisha and I did together uh, with Jyotindra Jain, with Ritu Kumar, Rahul with Jain. Rahul Jain, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. scholar and maker, sort of together looked at. Um, the question of Indian textiles from the perspective of curriculum, institution building, to making and building brands and the market, um, as well as sort of more uh, reflective questions like we shared earlier about uh, vocabulary and so on and so forth. We also, I mean, you're seeing an image of mm. the launch of this issue, yeah. uh, which was in Mumbai. And we decided to, um, something that Marg hadn't attempted before, we decided to do a fashion show and launch the issue to 600 people, hmm. something that you know a book, a conventional hmm. book launch would never be able to reach, and and, and f the fact yeah. that on a Tuesday morning there were, you know, 600 people to attend a book launch at Lakme Fashion Week hmm. in Mumbai was very encouraging, bringing in questions of the Actually, bi bikini sari which yeah, you see here. Yeah. The and issue had already sold out before the launch, yeah. and we had no issues <laughs> to sell at the launch, um, so it was a little. Um, you know, idiosyncratic, we were having a launch, but we had nothing to sell and uh, we couldn't get issues fast enough. And I think this has also been um, one of the things that we have discussed at Marg, at least, you know, when I was there, is how do you take Marg out? I mean, Marg, yes, it's important contribution. Yes, we've done a lot, but it's still quite niche. It still doesn't sort of, I think, um, Correct me if I'm wrong, Naman, but at least that was the discussions we were having, you know, uh, five years ago at Mark. That it still doesn't get ev everywhere. It doesn't reach people, especially young people. So how do we do it? And I think I think this was this was one event that really sort of took Mark out of the box, to, so to say, and um, and I think it can be a sort of a prelude to a lot of other things that Mark can do to to take Mark to places where you know Mark also hasn't been before. Yeah. I wanted to share a quick, um, you know, I mean, sh a quick anecdote here. I mean, you, we always look at the end book, right? We're looking at the book and saying, oh, these amazing images or interesting conversations or, or nice articles. And But what an issue like this also did was actually got the designers excited because often, um, you know, Marg was a kind of inaccessible other publication. So many, it also sort of made many of these designers be approached. I mean, Satya Paul, the third small image from the top is Satya Paul, the cocktail sari. He invented this idea of, you know, what you could wear to a cocktail party as a sari, um, you know, instead of a dress. So all of these questions and many of these design houses sort of, you know, had never even archived their own work yeah. when, you know, we remembered certain moments and we went back. So what the, some of these publications also have have helped achieve, it sort of excite people through whom we're inviting material from. Um, and I think those kinds of inadvertent sort of kind of, um, uh, you know, I journeys and adventures are also very exciting, I think. Uh, I mean, one, the of, the, one of, of the biggest challenges with this issue was actually to get images. I mean, we found even people like Laya Tayabji of Dastakar or, or Shah Mahuja. Or big or designers like Tarun Tahelyani yeah. didn't have archives. You yeah, know? they just hadn't yeah. documented. I mean, they might document an end product, but they would not document the process. Um, so I think that was one very challenging part of this issue. And it also made us think that, you know, we have recent histories of Indian textiles in this country, but how much is actually documented? How much is actually um, known? I mean, you know, we look at documenting the past, but what about documenting the last you know, 30 years or 40 years yeah. when so much has changed in the field in, in Indian textiles. And the word, the title was, you know, towards recent histories. And conventionally, you would so. look at these histories as modern or ancient or contemporary. So that has also been a constant effort, both in our curatorial work and writing that, you know, how do we stay away from these sort of given parameters? So we said, you know, towards recent histories of perhaps a more open way of actually looking at the period. And with that, um, we come to the issue which is under discussion.
uh, readings on textiles, uh, 75 years of mark. Um, Manisha, would you like to reflect on the issue? Um, An incredible, think, incredible yeah. resource for those of you who may be looking at you yeah. know, your first entry into Indian textile. Uh, into readings or writings on Indian textile histories. Um, yeah, we encourage you to buy the issue. I don't know how many copies are left. Almitra will tell us. Questions and ideas about what you want to talk about uh, with us. If there are any things that we can help you with or clarify for you, please ask us. Um, and we, we can use this and pass this along. Um, Um, yeah, the question I was just asked is that have we started digitizing these things? So in the screen grabs that I was showing you, all the articles, we've got a URL for each of those articles. And you can either download and buy an entire issue of Marg from 1946, a rare issue for 250 rupees, or you can buy a single article. Um, the magazine is still priced at 350 uh, and that's quite a challenge to make sure. That's why it's, uh, it's a challenge to make it available at 350 because obviously with the production values being what they are, it means we have to subsidize it hugely. But then that's also the joy of it because it reaches libraries and students and somebody grabs a copy and then they value their copy of Marg and they hang on to it. So. Perhaps it's a flawed business model, <laughs> but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I think we have to try. I don't have a question, but uh, just a clarification. I mean, I was told that the just in a good way, listening to all three of you, um, I will call you and you love. So it's just fantastic. And thank you for taking uh, personally me, Johnny. I mean, you made us walk through 2,000 years in five, 10 minutes, Mayank. It was brilliant. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Very informative. I was making my notes. I don't know why, but I was doing that. And Manisha and Mayank, thank you so very much. And as far as the business model, maybe the good old things work <laughs> like that and survive. I remember valuing my first seminar issue. So yeah, something like that. and Irol, who have created a generations of uh, uh, textile designers, apparel designers. Uh, would you like to say something about them, considering NID is your alma mater and one of the pioneer in textile documentation? Yes, uh, it's a very good question, because if Manisha will remember, one of the articles we did want to commission was on Indian textile education. And we couldn't find I mean, we, we approached a number of uh, educators, like Aditi Ranjan herself and MP Ranjan, and for some reason, uh, none of them agreed to writing this piece, either due to you know deadlines being short or them feeling that you know they needed more perspective, or many of them said, you know, we're teachers, we're not writers. But it is something that was definitely um, in our mind when we were sort of commissioning the articles. And I think it's a subject that needs to be written about um, and discussed. I don't think I'm the right person for it, but I think it's definitely something that needs to be written about. So definitely, the, the huge role So I think to successfully capture that, certainly, I mean, th the, Im the role that NID has played in shaping textile design pedagogy because uh, is immense because its early graduates have become the head of several other institutions like NIFT or Srishti and so on and so forth, or Pearl Academy today. 
but i think the i also feel that there needs to be a proper discussion about this and i think it begins with my own criticism of design education at nid which always looked at design as a value adding proposition where the maker was always someone inferior to design so i have problems with that design education too and i've spent the last 15 years since i have graduated trying to unlearn that to reach a point where in my own curatorial practice and writing i'm not i'm not i'm questioning this conditioning of the artist designer and craftsperson binary and hierarchy so i think to successfully capture that discussion there was a extraordinary conference in 2019 i think shawn was there in ahmedabad which looked at 50 years of indian of textile design at nid and many of these questions came up so i think that there are efforts to to look at this i don't think i'm the person to to write about it or discuss it because i feel there needs to be a balanced argument about this and i think those of us who were schooled at nid itself need to be aware that we are so conditioned to think uh, think about design as a higher um you know activity as a value added adding proposition and you know craft i had a problem with craft documentation i didn't do it at nid because i felt who am i as um as an upper class urban kid uh, to go and ask a crafts person to spend two weeks teaching me his trade i wouldn't be allowed that access in an advertising agency i wouldn't be allowed access in an architectural firm what gives me the agency so i had actually a very very big problem with craft documentation because all that material eventually goes into a public institution which is not even online available which is not accessible to anyone who can go um so i have issues with you know some of these things too and i think that it needs a certain perspective and it needs a good argument uh, before we can actually put it down in a publication or a conference but efforts are being made and there are re repeated conferences to acknowledge and uh, the role that many of these educators you mentioned have played in in textile design eril has uh, recently had a solo exhibition at the living traditions museum in kutch aditi um you know periodically is invited to give lectures and acknowledged as having played a very seminal role she gave the keynote at this conference so i think there are efforts i think i'm not the person to to really look at it very objectively because i have fundamental issues about design pedagogy in india yeah uh, one of the things we realized when my uncle and i when we were actually conceptualizing this issue is um we left a lot out and we know we left a lot out um and then we actually were hoping to plan another six issues no <laughs> man you know or maybe five issues where we would actually look i mean there is still so much to look at in the field of uh, you know even contemporary history of of textiles in india there are so many practitioners in this field i mean we may have looked at um you know justine or jyotindra but there's also jaya jaitley there's there's judy freiter there's anoki there's um i mean there's so many individual histories that need to be told also even whether it's with fashion um you know you can go back to um not only ritu kumar but you know also her contemporaries at the time um so so there is a lot um and we realize we left a lot out and so that's why we were hoping you know also you know to do to do more on the subject um as a result of which uh, i remember manisha telling me how do we bring in fab india for instance you know and fab india had actually you know uh, funded sponsored the first issue and the second issue because it went into a, a reprint and i actually haven't as an editor i made a conscious decision not to include uh, fab india except a mention because at that time the book on 50 years of fab india had come out by radhika singh so i felt why compete why we should complete you know so i think it's important to also look at some of these issues and publications in context and since there was an entire dedicated you know publication on 50 years of fab india and and i remember because they were the funders there was i didn't even know they were funding it because that's the policy at mark to prevent you know any kind of um, conditioning of the of the editorial approach so it was only when we went into second reprint and i remember we were going into the bombay launch and almitra very nervously said 
you know, my uncle, we don't even have copies for this launch where 600 people are going to be there. And she said, Fab India has very kindly agreed to do a second reprint. And I said, and, she, and, and I said, you know what? And I told Manisha, I should have taken your advice and included something on Fab India, but we didn't because I felt that, you know, Fab India was out there. It was something that all of us lived with. It was tangible, you know. So, thank you. I think your comment was good, and it's a very clear, good observation. Um, one of the reasons why this 75 years set of volumes has been done, my opening remark was for us to be able to take stock, not just and give ourselves a pat on the back on what we have achieved, but what we have left out. There are things we used to write about at Marg, which we stopped writing about. Um, there were reviews that we used to carry, um, which we didn't, which we stopped carrying. A critical forum for the living traditions and contemporary art just froze in India. The newspapers used to carry very vibrant reviews of classical music, dance, theater, cinema, but editors couldn't withstand the onslaught of practitioners who actually made it impossible to be able to write critically for somebody to have a negative opinion in this country about someone or about something. It was always taken as diminishing the efforts at revivalism, and it became very difficult. But with the hindsight of history, it is possible to be able to do evaluative studies and to be able to be more inclusive and to be able to write these things up. And one of the main intentions of this set of five volumes is going to be to notice the gaps. Because going forward for the next 75 years, I hope for Marg, one should have a roadmap and a vision about what were the gaps that Marg has left that Marg should get on with filling. And I think some of the institutions that have come up post-independence and their contribution does really need to be looked at. And so one of the first ones that we're going to be doing, I hope, in the field of textiles is going to be looking at the Weaver Service Centers more seriously. And then I hope we'll be able to look at NID too. Yeah. Yes. Mike here, please. Oh. Hello. Yeah, firstly, it was uh, indeed a pleasure listening to all three of you, and uh, especially from a publishing perspective also. So I come from a family of atypical Gujaratis. My grandfather was a director of Rupine Company. My father was director of Oxford. I am a pediatric wow. dentist. <laughs> so, uh, But it was thrilling because I have grown up in Oxford House around books and you know, hearing all kinds of deliberations going on. And one memory that comes back, and this is where the you know, sort of question comes in, because um, I remember that you know, used to sit Sunday mornings with the Illustrated Weekly or the Sunday Observer, which was a short-lived but beautiful newspaper. Mm. And it used to bring on a lot of add-on articles on, say, publications like these. And you know, there would be one full page on them. And that's how it would reach people yes. who would be not in the connect with which is normally your publishing. Mm. And do you hope to, or are you attempting to revive this? Because that will bring you completely out of the box. I'm just, you know. Yes, I mean, I think publishing images on a constant basis, as, as, pub as publishers of, uh, as an art journal, um, you know, it's not just about the ideas, but it's as much, and I had to cut my speech short, but one of the things that I wanted to talk about was the enormous contribution that has been made to telling these stories by our photographers. Okay. Half the work that we carry, half the paper space is actually image space. And it's not just about the ideas that are being written about, but it's also about the ideas that are being communicated through the visuals and through the graphic designers who have to be able to communicate it as clearly as possible to the public. 
um, to piece it all together. And their contributions in keeping a publishing house like this going are not small. And um, uh, finding illustrations that will say the thousand words that will fill a page normally, literally, is, is quite an uphill job. And I can imagine what Illustrated Weekly went through and what Life Magazine went through and what National Geographic has to do. And maintaining archives of images has, is something which is extremely important and something that we haven't even embarked on properly yet at Mark. But it is one of our housekeeping things that we need to be able to raise the capital to do through a corpus. Okay. Thank you. There's a question there. Jay. Hello, sir. Uh, a question. Hindi me pushta hu, kyunki meri Angrezi kuch zada achhi hai. Isliye aur kuch nahi. So the question is, uh, temple pe jo motifs hai, temple ke motifs jo kapdo pe aate hai, specifically on sarees and stuff like that. Uh, usme sirf cultural connotation hi hai ya cultural, religious, everything, all connotations are there. इसके ऊपर बहुत कम काम किया गया है और इसके ऊपर काम करना बहुत जरूरी है एंड अर्जेंटली इट नीड्स टू बी डन बिकॉज टेंपल्स के ऊपर जो ऑर्नामेंटेशन है वो सिर्फ ऑर्नामेंटल ही नहीं है उसका कोई माइंड वो कुछ इट्स एज अ मीनिंग एंड इट हैजन बीन डिसाइफर्ड इट हैजन बीन वर्क ऑन द मेटाफर्स इन्वॉल्व स्पेशली वेन इट कम्स टू द टेम्पल्स ऑफ उड़ीसा दैट्स अ वेरी गुड केस स्टडी Some things are quite simple, that you have a row of elephants at the bottom and you have a row of hunts on top. That's understandable why there is that difference. Mm. But um, the actual details of whether you will have water-related motifs in a doorway and you will have aerial motifs somewhere else and you'll have land-related motifs somewhere else and what those decorative ornaments, which we call just decorative, they're not actually always just j decorative. Sometimes they can be, but they are not always. And in the field of temple art and architecture, this has not been worked on. And um, this is a big gap. And once this is worked on, we will be in a better position because through the documentation that might exist for temples, we might get to understand the meaning of the decorative vocabulary that lies, the meaning behind the motifs that are being used in the textiles as well. So sometimes we, we don't know um, th is the answer about what the symbolic significance is, but I think it is possible to embark on such studies. I think there is material for this. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I just want to add to Naman because <clears throat> अगर आप पैठन देख लीजिए या आप वाराणसी देख लीजिए या बिष्णुपुर देख लीजिए या चंदेरी देख लीजिए या कांचीपुरम देख लीजिए सबसे बड़े जो हैंडलूम सेंटर्स हिस्टोरिकली और कंटेम्प्रेरी है वो टेंपल सेंटर्स हैं तो ये जो रिलेशनशिप है बहुत क्लोजली हमको पढ़ना है और ये बहुत महत्वपूर्ण है ये सवाल मेरे दिमाग में आने की एक वाजिब वजह ये थी बिकॉज लॉन्ग ईयर्स अगो आई वेंट टू पूरी विद माई फैमिली तो उन्होंने मेरे मॉम को जो सारी जब दी तब एक रिलीजियस फेस्टिवल करते हैं वो लोग अब आई डोंट रिमेंबर इट क्लियरली कि वो क्या था कैसे था बिकॉज इट्स लॉन्ग बैक बहुत पुरानी बात है वो लेकिन एक रिलीजियस फेस्टिवल किया गया था दैट वाज माय बेसिकली लॉजिक टू आस्क दिस क्वेश्चन कि कोई रिलीजियस कॉनोटेशन है या सिर्फ कल्चर ही एक पार्ट है या इट लुक्स गुड दैट्स वाइट डन ऑल ऑफ दी अब ओके थैंक यू वेरी मच क्वेश्चन on this side. So, congrats to Mark for 75 years. And Mark has been an heirloom to me. My mom used to work to translate Hindi to English for Marg when she was in college. And that is one of the reasons that I'm here. When I saw that we were doing 75 years, my mom was like, you need to go. <laughs> And I also study textiles, so that's another reason. And my question here is, when I tried to look up for textiles, I was in third standard when I tried to look up for textiles. I didn't find many references that said how to study textiles. Like when I say fashion, there's a whole line. Mm. 
every college is ready to teach you that but when you say textiles there is no drawn line yeah so that's exactly the problem i um as i told you i'm a professor at jnu and we advertised for a post we got the ugc and the government of india to sanction a post for a professorship in indian textile studies we've advertised the position twice and we haven't been able to fill it right <laughs> and there was nobody to fill it and this was quite scary um so we we began to think about how and what we need to do and how would we create a curriculum in today's day and age for this subject and um so now i think we hope uh that this reader which has worked out certain topics um textiles in motion histories of trade and influence that's the first chapter on looking at the whole very contemporary issue of migration and mobility people take their things with them and so that needs to be understood because the very first question is when we say textiles of this location but they are also being used in some other location yeah. and so that's one of the first ways in which textiles can add to our study of social sciences migration patterns and human civilization the second issue was production technology expertise community so actually looking at the producers and that became a key thing as to what are the things and social conditions that allow us that through textile what else can we study about society and we took a big anthropological view on how textiles need to be looked at as a source not just for reading the history of fashion but also to be able to read the history of civilization using textiles as a source just like we could use temples as a source to read history or read use books or sanskrit texts or whatever to read history you can use textiles as a source for writing the history of civilization so like that we created these chapters um section 3 was textile politics authority identity and patronage and section 4 was designing for changing markets which was about what are the dilemmas that textile studies face today now within these four broad categories we had each article was representative of a type of study that can be done mm -hmm. it wasn't Uh, to show the variety of indian textiles only it was about the kind of studies that can be done because we couldn't squeeze everything into a single volume and we were hoping that this volume then might inspire someone to create a course to have a a blueprint on what can be done on creating a course on indian textiles what would be the issues that you would talk about so that was a thinking I just wanted to say is that you know when you study textiles you can come from different backgrounds I mean all three of us have come from different um backgrounds in our um in 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 you know when we were in university and I mean Naman is from art history I'm from anthropology um Mayank is from um in a sense design or and from NID so so maybe that's why when you when you when you look up fashion you will find you know um methodology and course structure but when you look up textiles you may not because you can approach the study of textiles from so many different um ways and so many different um sort of subject headings that there is no one um one way um also the shaping of a curriculum on indian textile histories is very challenging Uh, very very challenging and i think one of the things that one is always sort of concerned about is that uh, you know art has this kind of tendency to have an affair with architecture and then it'll have an affair with film and it'll have an affair with craft so today there's so many exhibitions and publications on textiles and so much is being viewed from the art world because it's having an affair with textiles so at that point um you know how does textile sort of stand on its own as a field um and it doesn't inherit and doesn't transfer to itself the issues that art historians face in india um you know architecture historians face in india and so on and so forth so it's it's also very very challenging and it'll it'll take a village to actually fill the gap um 
so it's it's very challenging it's you know one has attempted it several times and one you know how to link you know i mean you may find in a textile the same motives and the tendency usually for historians would be to to attribute a similarity or a shared connection and there may be but when you look at the structure of these two textiles often they are fundamentally from two cultures of textile making you know they represent modes of production which are so diverse and different so how do you link this kind of a material study to a more civilizational perspective like naman was sharing it's a huge challenge um okay we should we should call it uh a night Deep respect for what all of three of you are doing. And I come from Punjab and I'm a partition scholar and the textile has played such an important role during partition and how that memories and the life was passed through a piece of cloth from one generation to the generation. So I'm just very curious in all this. I can't see the contents because my spectacles not right, but did you did somebody write about uh, textiles during partition not specifically about partition on this occasion but it has been uh, dealt with in terms of the broader concept of migration and mobility both nomadism na changing national boundaries uh, and just as heirlooms mm -hmm. so the interesting thing is t textile in as a subject of heirloom is something that we have talked about and that is a big subject now absolutely um, that we do talk about. I'm going to uh, no. I'm going to call it quits. <laughs> we'll carry on with our conversations <laughs> afterwards. Thank um, you so much. Thank you and Ooh. thank you. <laughs> okay, so this has been a very stimulating discussion, which is only to be expected. Marg has been at the forefront of covering India's vast textile traditions and interestingly we have found that whenever we have brought out a publication devoted to textiles it has been a sellout. Uh, for example, Marg's book on Pashmina shawl by Janet Rizvi and Monisha Emmert has gone into a second reprint with very few copies left. A book on sacred textiles of India by Jasleen Damija has sold out. And our Marg magazine titles, Colors of Nature's Dyes from Indian Subcontinents by Jenny Balfour Paul has sold out. Thread and Voices, edited by Laila Tayabji, has very few copies left. And Cloth in India, Mayang's uh, magazine, uh, that has completely sold out. The two reprints that we did, one after the <laughs> fashion show, <laughs> sold out. And I have to correct you that Mark did have a fashion show of Pashmina shawls uh, yeah, at the British Sorry. Council in Delhi. So we did do something. Uh, yeah. And uh, finally, um, uh, the, this particular, uh, the, this latest edition is also uh, an, an additional uh, print out because uh, an additional reprint because we've we completely sold out the first uh, lot so this is our second reprint uh, publishing on India's rich culture which encompasses textiles and more requires support from invested patrons of the arts every volume of mark takes one to three years to plan research design and print we are a small but dedicated team providing a platform for our many intellectually rich gurus, craftspeople, artists and photographers. The endeavor to take their work to the highest academic levels and institutions the world over. And we cannot do this without the kind of help and support you have shown us today. On behalf of the Mark Foundation, many, many thanks are due. Thank you, Mr. Bhopal Patwardhan, Executive Board Chairman of Bodhi, for giving us this beautiful space. <laughs> Thank you, Rasika, for organizing and hosting this lovely evening. And a big thank you to your team as well. Thank you. Thank you, Naman, for your wonderful insights as always. Thank you, Monisha, for being a part of MARG. 
thank you, Mayank, for your continuous enthusiasm and involvement with Mark. Thank you to our supporters. Uh, the magazine can only come out with our supporters, BNP Paribas, TBS Motor Company Limited, and Lafayette Designs Delhi. And finally, thank you to all the invitees here who have helped make the evening so special. Please continue to enjoy the evening. Do pick up copies of the magazines for yourselves and to give the special festive season. Thank you. <laughs>